Well, it's Dr. Phil, which means you've found your way to fill in the blanks. And I have one of the most interesting people you are ever going to find. No pressure. I'm not putting pressure on you here. But I'm with Jason Flom today. Now, he has a lot of different hats he wears, and I'm going to let him explain some of this, but he is one of the most successful music executives in music. He is an author. He's written a great children's book called Lulu is a Rhinoceros. And I was able to feature that on Dr. Phil, and it's an amazing book. If you don't have it, you should get it so your kids can read it. It's all about feeling good about who you are, even if you're a little bit different. It's just amazing. Illustrated, great book. And he is also one of the foremost advocates for wrongful convictions in the United States. He is on the board of the Innocence Project, and he has gotten more people out of wrongful convictions than anybody I know, that's for sure. And he's very humble about it, and we'll say he just played a role here and there. But he is a passionate, passionate advocate. We've worked together and are working together now on some cases, and I trust are going to work together many years in the future because he is very, very passionate about this and has a couple of podcasts of his own that I think are intriguing. You cannot turn them off. I'm going to let him tell us about that. So welcome, Jason Flom. Well, thank you. You said no pressure, but now I don't even know what to say anymore because, you know, I mean, how do you say no pressure while you're putting pressure on? It's like, uh, okay. That's like when somebody says not to interrupt you, but you know what I mean? But, and then they interrupt you. Yeah, exactly. Well, you are a very successful music executive. You're a prison reform activist. Your wrongful conviction podcast is just amazing. I wish you would put them out more frequently than you do because they're so intriguing you should put them out like every day. So everyone should be as much of a workaholic as you are. I'm getting yeah. the hit. I'm, I'm reading between the lines. Yeah. And it's impossible to keep up with your pace, even though I try. But the fact is, you know, we have now, we're now finishing up our ninth season. So we have about a hundred episodes out there, which sounds like a lot, but there's so many more to be done because there's so many, unfortunately, tragically, there's so many of these stories. And I want to tell every one of them and, and create sort of a living memorial to these remarkable people, the exonerees themselves, and the people who are still in, who are wrongfully convicted, who are somehow or other managing to maintain hope and who are courageous and graceful in the midst of a predicament that I think would crush almost anyone. Well, they have good stories. They have stories that need to be told. But you're a good storyteller. You tell the story in a way that people can relate to. You don't over-advocate. You acknowledge the things that need to be acknowledged about. Some of these guys are not angels. They've got some criminal background sometimes. But there's a big difference between stealing hubcaps and murder. Some of these guys, when they were kids, teenagers, they would do little petty crimes here or there. And then they're sitting on death row, and that's been used against them. And we'll talk about that when we talk about some specific cases. But tell me how you got interested in this. Now, you're... Dad, Joseph Lom, led the really famous law firm, Skadden Arps, which if you're in the litigation arena at all, they are big hitters. I mean, big hitters, top hundred law firms in the country always. And his nickname was Mr. Takeover for his pioneering work in mergers and acquisitions. And he also was an activist, really helped a lot of kids get where they couldn't get otherwise. But that was him doing white-collar law, not criminal law, with people that couldn't really understand the process. How did you get so involved and intrigued in these wrongful convictions? Well, if you don't mind, I'm just going to say a few words about my dad first, because my dad, Joe, was my hero and my mentor, and he taught me uh, almost everything I know. But he was a remarkable guy in so many ways. You know, the son of immigrants who spoke no English. They spoke Yiddish. They came from Russia. And they were basically homeless, you know, when he was growing up. Which is to say they would move every month because in those days, post-depression, you could get a free month's rent if you moved in Brooklyn to different apartments. So they were like nomads in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> 
But that being said, he went to City College at night, worked during the day, slept on the subway, and, and subsisted on a diet of chocolate donuts and coffee because that's all he could afford. Anyway, World War II broke out. He went into the Army, and when he came out, he wrote a letter when the war ended. He wrote a letter to Harvard Law School, and he said, I don't have any money, and I don't have a college degree, but I am a GI, and I'm the best thing since sliced bread. And if you let me in, you won't regret it. And they gave him a full-ride scholarship to Harvard Law School. Now, that was where the days, of course, this is a separate topic for a separate podcast, when we treated veterans with the respect that they're due. And I think it's a national shame that we don't do that anymore. But what happened with me was... Let me just say, you know, I was in the litigation arena for most of my professional career, and your dad was legend in the litigation arena. I mean, there's nobody in mergers and acquisitions that didn't know who he was and respect him. His reputation was huge. Everybody knew who he was when I was in that game. So him being your hero, I certainly understand. He really accomplished a lot. No, and I'll say one thing that I think maybe some members of your audience will really take away from this. You know, many people have asked my brother and I why we didn't become lawyers. And the fact is that when we were kids, my dad said to us, as it relates to what to do with your life, he said, do whatever you want to do, try to be the best at it, but just make the world a better place. He said, that's the only definition of success that matters. And, you know, I wanted to be a success in his eyes, so hopefully I've managed to live up to some part of what he laid out for us as a plan. Well, your mother was no slight. She graduated from Cornell at 18. She did. She graduated from Cornell what at 18. The hell? Yeah. She used when she to start uh, when she was 12. How do you graduate Cornell when you're 18? Yeah, she used to remind me of that every uh, maybe <laughs> twice a week you know, <laughs> as I was not excelling in my later years in school. But the fact is that I had fallen in love with the music business by then, but that's a different story as well. Yeah, her sister said her teacher just didn't like her, so they kept skipping grades for her, you know. But <laughs> yeah. The fact is, she was a very brilliant woman, my mother, and a pioneer in special education, as it turns out, which she started because of my brother, who's a remarkable story in and of his own right. But that being said, I guess, you know, the law is in my blood. I mean, I'm a college dropout because I fell in love with the music business early. And even by the time I was a junior at NYU, you know, I had a couple records on the charts. And my dad said, you're better off doing one thing right than two things wrong. So I was like, thanks, dad, I'm out of here. But I'm certainly a passionate advocate. And I found my calling in my early 30s. And going back to your original question, Doc, you know, it was a serendipitous situation, which was that I opened up a newspaper that I didn't normally read. I think it was a daily news, but I was on my way to play tennis, something you can certainly relate to. And I wanted something to read. And the time was sold out and I grabbed the news and there was a story in there, the news or the post, about a kid named Stephen Lennon who was serving 15 years to life for a nonviolent first offense cocaine possession charge in a maximum security prison in New York State. You know, I thought I was reading the wrong story. I was like, I don't even understand how this could be. I didn't know anything about mandatory sentencing cases back then. And, you know, I had struggled with substance abuse as a teenager and into my 20s. So, you know, I sort of thought, wow, you know, there but for the grace of, you know, who knows what go I, right? And it really hit me. And I decided I had to try to do something about it if I could. And I was too naive to know that this was a virtually impossible thing to do. But I called the only criminal defense attorney I knew. It was a guy named Bob Kalina. He represented some of the rock acts that I had signed, including Stone Temple Pilots and Skid Row. And they were getting arrested, you know, weekly. So I had him on speed dial. So I called Bob and I said, Bob, you know, is there anything you can do? He said, there's nothing you can do. It's Rockefeller drug laws. This is just thousands of cases like this. What do you want? And I said, well, do me a favor to talk to the one. So he talked to the mother, her mother, Stephen's mother. It was the kid's name was Stephen Lennon. His mother's name was in the article. She had been advocating for clemency for him from Governor Mario Cuomo and had recently been turned down. And it made the newspaper because she had gotten some very high level support from some very prominent people, including Geraldine Ferraro. And so that's why I was in the paper. I asked Bob to talk to Shirley, the mom. He did. He agreed to take the case pro bono. And even though he said it was hopeless, we ended up in a courtroom six months later in Malone, New York, which is right up on the Canadian border. And They brought this kid, Stephen, in in shackles like he was Charles Manson or something. Nonviolent first offense, remember. The arguments went back and forth, and I didn't really know what I was experiencing or listening to, but I did know that I was sitting there holding Mrs. Lennon's hand with her husband standing on the other side of her. And when the judge banged the gavel down and said the motion is granted, that was it. I mean, that was the greatest feeling I'd ever had outside of the birth of my daughter at that time. It was that lightning bolt moment. You know how that is. And 
I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do more of that. I didn't know how to, but I knew I was going to try to figure it out. How long did it take before they let him out? About a month. He had served nine years to the day when he was released, but he had six more years before he was parole eligible because of mandatory sentencing laws. So, you know, and it was interesting, Doc, because he came to see me after he got out. He came to New York City from upstate and we had lunch and he said to me, listen, you know, I was a knucklehead. You know, he says, I'll admit it. I was doing stupid stuff and I might've gotten killed doing what I was doing, you know, because I was, I thought I was a, you know, (laughs) some kind of character or whatever. So he said, but you know what? After a year in prison, there was nothing you could get me to do. I wouldn't cross the street against the light. He goes, I'm not trying to go back there under any circumstances. I don't need 15 years to figure it out. So the whole disproportionality of it, the whole draconian nature of the sentencing laws hit me like a ton of bricks. I did some reading. I read an article in Rolling Stone magazine which featured the work of this organization called Families Against Mandatory Minimums, FAMM.org. Um, and I got in touch with them and joined their board. And then soon after that, learned about the work of the Innocence Project through something I saw on TV and you know, went down to their offices, sort of unannounced, just walked in. And it was two guys in a room, the two founders, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, were sitting there mm-hmm. in a room with a briefcase, a phone, and a dream. And I said, I'm your guy. I'll do whatever you need, and I'll do more than that. And I'm in. You know, that was a long time ago. That was in the uh, early to mid-90s. You talk about this as draconian. We've talked about this before, but I want to talk about it a little bit more because when you enter the court system as a guy like you're describing, he was how old at the time? 31 or 32, and he had been in for eight plus years already. So I guess he was in his early 20s yeah, when so he was arrested. in his early 20s. And I think this is really prominent for people that don't have education, or income. My point is, you go into the court system, and the whole thing is stacked up to, number one, intimidate you, and number two, violate the rights that you're actually told that you're going to get. Think about it. If you're a kid, particularly a nonviolent first offender, you walk in there, and what do you see? Well, the judge is elevated. You know, he's up on a bench. He's got flags on both sides of him. He's got a big seal behind him. Everything looks super official. Robe. He's got a robe. Yeah, he's in the robe, and he's sitting up looking down. He's got armed guards on either side of him. They call them bailiffs, but they're armed guards, and you can find out exactly how armed they are if you do something that they don't like. Then the prosecutor comes in, and he's in that court every day. So he knows that judge, they're on a first name basis, and the court reporter is on a first name basis with everybody. Then you come in. And the judge probably used to be a prosecutor because we know that about 80% of judges in America are former prosecutors. Of course. And they're all wearing suits and they can stand, but you remain seated. And then they bring you up if you testify, which most of the time they tell you not to do because they think you're going to be an idiot. And in a lot of cases, they probably might be better off to not testify. But you're sitting down, and they start talking about your life. The lawyers are all in power suits. They're standing up, walking around. And you're sitting there like, what the hell? So the most important time of your life is in a very foreign setting. And I always say, if you're going to have a battle and you're going to have any chance of winning, you need pick your battles. You need to pick your battlefield. You need to pick the time. You need to pick the circumstance. You get to do none of that in this situation. And then if you stub your toe and you get a guilty verdict or you get bad advice from a public defender and take a plea deal, then you hit these mandatory sentences. I don't know how many there are now, but we've got people in, first offenders, nonviolent, on drug charges in states where it's now legal. Right. We've got people serving life in states where it's now legal. Where it's now, it's no longer a crime. Right. I mean, and that sounds like some like, wait, wait, what are you talking about? Like, what planet are we on? That makes no damn sense. And by the way, one other thing I wanted to add to what you were saying before, Doc, about the courtroom situation is that a week ago today, I was in San Quentin visiting a guy who I'm hoping will be freed very shortly, who was explaining to me that when he was at trial, it's an LA case, He was held in the L.A. County Jail, um, which is a 
unbelievably dangerous and scary environment. He said he saw a guy get his throat slit in church uh, while he was being held. He said, you know, he saw a lot of terrible things, but that was the lowest. But he was saying that, and I think this is for the most part the same around the country, but on days when you're going to court, they wake you up at three o'clock in the morning to start the process of getting you transferred and getting you whatever the hell it is. Then you go to a holding cell in the courthouse, right? And by the time you get to court, you know, you have slept because they don't bring you back until almost midnight, right? Because by the time they deal with all the paperwork and all the other stuff. So as he was saying, you're getting three hours of sleep a night if you're really lucky. And then you're going through, you may not be getting fed because with all the, you're missing meals as you're, you know, you're getting back to prison. It's not yeah. like they're giving you a meal on the bus. So you're in actually the most weakened state. It's literally the opposite of the scenario that you described, right? It'd be a miracle if you could have a rational thought. And here you are literally with your life on the line and you have got to be ready to help your defender mount a defense in any way you can because ultimately it's your life is not theirs and there's a lot of very good defenders out there but there's a lot of them that are overworked and underpaid and overmatched and underqualified some of them are drunk you know and here you are in an impossible situation with your life on the line so anyway back to what you were saying yeah, and the public defenders, as you say, a lot of these men and women are passionate and competent and want to do a good job. And some of them aren't. The thing that bothers me is no matter how good they do, no matter how hard they work, they get rid of a case, they've got an endless line standing there. So working hard on a case, it doesn't improve their quality of life or their day because it's like spitting in the ocean. They're never going to get to the end of the line. So if they work hard, don't work hard. It's the same effect on the public defenders. No, that's right. Many of them are juggling over the course of a year. It could be as many as 400 cases. And so since we know courts aren't open on the weekends, you could be talking about more than one case on average per day. And right. that's if you don't have any time off. So it could be two or three cases a day. And some of them mean really well. There's that wonderful movie called Gideon's Army that profile some of these heroic public defenders, but they're seriously underpaid. And they are, as you said, paid by the hour. You know, you can't really expect too much. But I wanted to ask you this. I was thinking about this the other day, Doc. So I've seen many cases where the person gets convicted and in the ensuing days or weeks, their defender gets disbarred for all sorts of misbehavior, right? Could be anything from being high or drunk to being a criminal themselves, to being mentally unstable. I know how I feel, but I wanted to ask you whether you feel like if there's a certain window of time after which you're convicted that your defender gets disbarred for any one of these types of misbehavior, should you be entitled to a retrial almost automatically? Well, it seems to me that you clearly have a constitutional right to adequate representation. And if you don't have adequate representation, then you've not had due process. I mean, you're entitled to a timely and fair trial. And if you don't have a timely and fair trial, then it seems to me that you've not gotten what you're constitutionally guaranteed. We've got a saying in Texas, for every rat you see, there's 50 you don't. And if you see a prosecutor... It's just like when you see a medical examiner that has faked autopsies or just made them up. You find that on one case. Well, let me assure you, do you think that's not true on 50 other cases? So that's called into question. If a medical examiner has been found to be incompetent or dishonest, they throw out every case that he's ever dealt with. Why would you not do it with lawyers? Right. We've had that with drug lab scandals as well, like exactly. in, in Boston, where that woman was found to have been stealing drugs, lying about the quantity of drugs, lying about the types of drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And they had to reopen or throw out, I think, 20,000 cases because of her years and years of malfeasance. It's, it's probably too kind of a word. And while we're at it, let's not forget the fact that we have these mobile drug testing uh, protocols in this country, which we know are so wildly inaccurate, and yet yeah. people are going to jail every day because they're getting, you know, they're mistaking in these field drug tests when they pull somebody over, they've mistaken 
donut crumbs, baking soda, baby powder, baby formula. They mistook bird poop for, I think, methamphetamine in one of these yeah. tests. And yet they're still in practice and people are still being arrested based on that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we don't have a system that we would like to think that we do. I think most people go to bed at night thinking that the system is fair until something happens to somebody that they love. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what the hell is going on here? So that's why I'm so thrilled that, you know, to be here with you actually spreading the word and helping to hopefully move the needle to affect change so that we can eventually have this pendulum swing back to a place where we have a system that's fair for everyone. Well, what do you think needs to happen? If we've got these people On death row, Rodney Reed, example that we've worked on, where four medical experts say it's not possible he did it. And so he finally gets a new trial after 22 and a half years. What's wrong with the system that this person got convicted and has sat there 22 and a half years before somebody pays attention and says, okay, we need to look at this again? There's no way you can give him back 22 and a half years, even if. He gets a new trial, even if he is found not guilty at that new trial, he still lost 22 and a half years of his life. What's wrong with the system that the burden of proof is really not being respected? That's a very good and a very complex question to answer, but we'll attempt to tackle it right now. And and we cover this on my podcast, which you've been so kind to support wrongful conviction with Jason Flom. And I hope people will tune in and learn more about these causes. Cause I did want to mention before we even get into the actual systemic problems that there are cases that you'll hear on my podcast where defense attorneys didn't call witnesses that were in the courtroom, right? They were just waiting to be called that could have actually changed the outcome of the trial, but they just didn't do it. You know, who knows why? I can't imagine. There have been cases where Attorneys didn't show up for court or they slept through big parts of the trial. And yet these convictions stand for reasons that are beyond me. But I think the first problem comes, Doc, from mass incarceration itself. When you have a system that processes as many people as we do, it is impossible for it to work the way it's supposed to. And it wasn't always like this, right? We had a system where 30, 35 years ago, we had 300,000 something people in prison and jail in America. Now we have 2.2 million. The system's not designed to be able to handle that kind of caseload. Why is that jump from 300,000 to 2.2 million? There's a number of reasons for that. It started with Nixon's war on drugs, right? And, you know, we know now because, uh, what was it, uh, Haldeman, right? His aide that came out just the last year or two, and said that President Nixon wasn't actually interested in drugs, but he he wanted to declare a war on black people and hippies, and he couldn't call it that. So he came up with a different idea, I don't want to say clever, but a devious plan to call it something other than what it was. And at the time, no one cared about drugs in America. It wasn't even in the top 50 of concerns of, of the general public. Police departments also didn't care about it. And when they found out that police departments didn't want to go around and arrest people for low level drug crimes, they created these incentive plans, right, where they would give federal money to the police departments in exchange for them meeting quotas of arresting people, mostly young people, and charging them with these low level drug crimes. So of course, that was the first thing that exploded the prison population. And then the politicians started passing these mandatory sentencing laws, and they got worse and worse. It was very difficult at that time for a Democrat, and still is, I guess, for anyone to stand up and say, I think we should lower the drug laws or lower these laws or or lessen sentences. And then they'd be afraid to get called out and called soft on crime. And of course, you know, when Dukakis was running for president, it was leading by a lot. And the Bush team came up with this idea that they would sort of launch this ad that was so diabolical, right? They took one case of a guy who was on a furlough in a program when he was the governor of Massachusetts and then had gone and committed an awful crime. When they said, you know, that one case proves that this guy, you know, wants to let everybody out of prison and wants to, you know, and it was an early progenitor of what we have now where we try to demonize people and we try to, you know, politicians take individual cases and try to scare everyone into passing these stricter and stricter and harsher and more conservative, I guess you could say, 
laws that end up doing nothing but locking up generations of people, mostly people of color. It's a national shame. And I think the pendulum is finally swinging back in the other direction now, certainly on the state level. And hopefully we'll see more progress on the federal level. But it's way overdue. And the number of lives that have been destroyed and the number of families that have been destroyed. Everyone that goes to prison, Doc, is somebody's family member, right? Those people are moms, dads, uncles, aunts, their children or brothers or sons and daughters. They may be grandparents. And the whole family goes through terrible hardship when they're, uh, especially if it's somebody who's a breadwinner, or if it's a mom or anyone, goes to prison. And then the cycle continues. Well, and one of the things people don't realize is when you try to fight back after you've gotten this kind of conviction, the appellate process starts with getting your judge to admit that he's done something wrong. Right. You're actually getting somebody to criticize themselves. Right. You go back in front of the same judge in most cases, exactly. right? And it's and that's another that's thing. It starts. That's, but we've got to stop it on the front end. I mean, these wrongful convictions and these mandatory sentencing cases that I've I've gotten involved with and in some cases been able to make a difference in um, are a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's very meaningful to any individual person, but it's a dry, it's a tiny drop in the bucket. And, uh, you know, I wish I could help everyone. And I, and I, you know, I'm going to do everything in my power to affect positive change on a macro level so we can impact many, many more people. But we have to fix the system. You know, we have this thing now called the guilty plea problem, right? There's a hashtag guilty, hashtag guilty plea problem now. And, um, you know, 97% of felony convictions, as you know, in this country are results yeah. of guilty pleas. And the fact is, it's the only way people can really deal with this, uh, exactly the scenario that we've just laid out, right? When they know they're going into court with virtually no hope in hell of proving their innocence, they may decide, and, and these many of these people are people who came from neighborhoods where they've seen the justice system at its worst, and they go in and they go, you know what, if I got to do, you know, a certain amount of time in prison, even if it's years, I'm not going to take a chance that I get life or something else, you know, if I, if I have to, if I, you know, try to plead my innocence. Well, that's the leverage that makes the playing field so unfair because the prosecutor's not going to take a case to trial that he or she doesn't feel like they can win. That doesn't mean the person is guilty, but they've stacked up all the evidence that they have. They know what that trier of fact, if it's to the bench, or they can persuade a jury with. And they have unlimited resources. Correct. The prosecutor, if they need to put 500 man hours, they can put 500 man hours. The public defender can maybe put three. If you're lucky. And so I've said before, the biggest problem with the justice system that I see is you're entitled to the best defense money can buy. That's right. And we're, it's, it's in, you know, we'll get into the economics of it and, and how economics really drives all of this or socioeconomics. Um, but the, you know, the fact is I want to talk about two trial by ambush. And, and also I want to make a recommendation for anyone who's listening. If you want to do, you want to read one book about this, there's a book out right now called Usual Cruelty. That's Usual Cruelty by Alec Carr Katsanis. And you won't be able to remember that name probably or spell it. I have a hard enough time doing it. But if you just Google Usual Cruelty, I promise you, if you read the first 20 pages of this book, you'll be more woke than many law students in this country. And you'll really begin to understand the, the, the intensity of the problem that we have on a macro level and a micro level of how this system has broken down. But, but yes, of course, Doc, the fact is that all of this was driven by economics, right? It's, there's that, you know, the new Jim Crow, another wonderful book by Michelle Alexander that talks about the fact that this mass incarceration grew out of slavery, ultimately, right? And it is the modern day, in my view, um, people may criticize me for this, but it's the modern day equivalent. We only had, slavery is only illegal in one state. And people are going to say, wait, wait, they're, so they're Googling now. They're going, that guy flom's crazy. Phil, what'd you do? But the fact is that slavery was never made illegal in this country. It was only made illegal for free people. So it was sort of a bone they threw to the South uh, at the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So as a result, what happened was in the aftermath, People went around, authorities went around arresting black people, people of color, 
for loitering, for not having an ID on them, for not having a job, for mowing their lawn the wrong way, for anything. We've got thousands of laws in this country. Nobody knows, no one could possibly know all of them. And then they put them in prison where there was convict leasing and all this other stuff, and it became this new form of slavery. And now today, we have prisons in America. Listen, we make, everyone knows you make license plates there, but they make Victoria's <clears throat> Secret underwear and Starbucks coffee cups and so many things you wouldn't think are made in prison. And you know what? The labor can be as cheap as four cents a day, an hour, or, you know, out here, you have a dollar. Uh, was a dollar a day or a dollar an hour they pay the firefighters that, that, right. are, that are you know coming out of the prison and, and doing this heroic work and then they aren't even allowed to become firemen when they get out it's insane they train them for the fight fires and they come out and risk their lives for this pittance and then they can't become firemen so the one state do you know what the one state is where slavery was outlawed last year in a referendum colorado really they're the first one yeah it was a, it was a um it was a referendum a ballot referendum and they outlawed slavery, so they can't do that in Colorado anymore. But uh, everywhere else, they still can, and in most places, they do. So there's an economic incentive. It's an eighty billion dollar industry, the prison industrial complex. So there's a tremendous economic uh, uh, incentive to keep it the way it is, and that's got to change too. There's a, a wonderful organization called Worth Rises, run by my friend Bianca Tylek, who is taking on this this problem and suing prisons and 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 trying to take the profit out of it because until we do i don't think we're going to see real change oh no now when you got started in this you went to a dinner with president clinton you weren't seated real close to him but you did a little shuffling of the place cards, I understand. <laughs> I did. So you can get closer to President that. Clinton. Should I be admitting that on uh, on fill in the blanks? I guess so. Too late now. The cat's out of the bag. Yeah, you already um, have. So we're going to fill in this blank so right now. So tell that story. Yeah. So um, I was... Uh, I was lucky to be invited to a dinner at someone's home um, at which the outgoing president, because at that point it was September of uh, 99, I think, and President Clinton was going to be there. And I made sure up front that I was going to be seated at his table, but I wanted to be as close to him as I could be. And when I got there and went and looked at the name tags, I didn't like where they were. Um, You know, the place cards, I should say. So I... uh, I did what I had to do and got myself seated directly across from him because it was an oval table and this was the short way. And at that dinner, Doc, I got him engaged in a conversation about the the drug laws and mandatory sentencing and, you know, uh, about his brother, you know, who had served time for, a, but, but a, you know, a year for a drug crime back in the day. And I talked to him about how these days it would have been a lot more difficult for him. He would have served a long time in a, a very, a very harsh environment. And um, I had a letter in my pocket from a woman, I think her name was Amy Polfel, who President Clinton had granted clemency to not, not too long before this dinner. He hadn't granted a lot of them, but very, very few, but this was one. And I handed him the letter, and he read it at the table, and he put it in his pocket, or he read part of it, and I said to him, so Mr. President, what you did for Amy and several other people was wonderful, even heroic, but I know of hundreds of cases just as bad as, that, as those. And he says, you get them to me and I'll sign them. And everybody at the table sort of stopped doing what they were doing. was like, what did I just hear that? What did he say? And and I was like, and then I thought that I I had one really lucid moment. I said, wait a minute, um, Mr. President, with all due respect, when you leave here tonight, you're not going to be the easiest guy for me to get a hold of. I don't think anyone's giving me your number. I don't have you on my speed dial. No, no, no. So. I said, how do you recommend I go about doing this? So he pointed to a guy who was one of his aides, and he said, go speak to this guy. And he said, you'll have to go through Bruce Lindsay, who is the chief counsel in the Justice Department, and and go through the normal process. I said, what type of cases will you look at? And, you know, he said he was interested in first offense, nonviolent offenders, uh, uh, nonviolent first offenders, I should say, who had served at least, you know, a handful of years. And... So I went back to Families Against Mandatory Minimums, F-A-M-M, like I said, .org, check it out. Um, and we scrambled and compiled a list of cases. That and you got 17 out of 25. Ended up submitting 25 ultimately and, and got 17 um, with an assist from my dad. And, um, you know, he, he, was, he gave me some great advice about how to 
you know, navigate the system because you can't just send them in and hope. That's not a good strategy. You no, know? but apparently what did your whistle? Because during the two terms that Obama served, you got nearly 2,000 prisoners released. Well, well, I certainly didn't, I didn't get those prisoners I, released. I, but, I know, you know you always say that, but you were involved, let's say. I was involved in, a, you know, in, in the following way. It wasn't a direct involvement like with President Clinton, certainly not. But the fact is that um, when it became clear that President Obama was going to consider granting a significant number of clemencies uh, uh, in his last year in office, you know, uh, I worked with the NACDL, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, Norm Reimer there is a fantastic uh, uh, human being and a very talented lawyer. And he, um, you know, he asked me if I would sponsor uh, some lawyers to um, help process these clemency applications because we knew at that point that President Obama would consider granting clemency to people who were serving what I would call illegal sentences under the old crack cocaine laws. And when I say that, I worked very hard on, on, on trying to bring attention to the disparity in the mandatory sentencing between crack and cocaine because it was treated as a hundred times more it was treated a hundred times more severely than coke even though they're pharmaceutically identical there's a racial reason behind that too and the fact is racial or racist or whatever you want to call it because the overwhelming majority of crack cocaine arrests were people of color and the overwhelming majority of coke arrests were people uh, uh, white people so um, we were the, the Senator Durbin sponsored this legislation, which reduced the disparity to 18 to one. He would have liked to bring it all the way down, but he had to make a deal with the Republicans at the time. And but it wasn't done retroactively, which drives me nuts, Doc. Right. Like, how do you change a law and say, but tough, tough, you know, I don't know if I can curse on this show, but tough shit on you if you were arrested before we had the good sense to change this ridiculous law. And so I was you know, really working as, as hard as I could to try to bring every one of those cases, there are about 10,000 of them in the federal system, you know, th that's a rough number. And I thought that there's no justice until those people are sent home because they're serving sentences that we've acknowledged are wrong and don't make any sense. So anyway, I just sponsored um, some very talented young lawyers to help process these clemency applications. I think about half of them that he did grant, he granted about 1,700 of them in the last flourish. And about half of those were people that the NACDL worked on, but I was, you know, very, very peripherally involved in those. Well, you uh, made a spurious allegation about me being a workaholic, but during this time that you were hmm. doing all of this... You just elicited laughter from your own <laughs> producer, <laughs> so your credibility on this is not, not good. strong. Not good. Not good. While you're doing all of this, you were still in the music business with the Lava Label, just even the Lava Label. You sold over 100 million records globally. We're talking Matchbox 20, Kid Rock, Sugar Ray. You oversaw successful releases with Lenny Kravitz, Coldplay, The Rolling Stones. Under your leadership, you got Jarrett Leto, 30 Seconds to Mars, Katy Perry, one of the boys, to gold and platinum. You identified Lord, unknown artist from New Zealand. Uh, what, you just happened to be driving through New Zealand? <laughs> That's funny. Saw her at a wedding? <laughs> yeah, what, right. what the hell? <laughs> Saw her busking on the side of the road. That's a better story. Yeah. I just I just found her music in my inbox, actually. Um, it was, it's a good enough story. But, Groundbreaking um, debut single, Royals, which reigned at number one for it, eight weeks. Yeah, and you know what's crazy about that song? And I think this way, because I think it turns to synchronicity and serendipity and that kind of stuff. And... The crazy thing was that she wrote Royals because she saw a picture of George Brett in a Royals uniform. Now, first of all, they don't play baseball in New Zealand, so right. none of this makes any damn sense. But she saw it on the Internet and it inspired her to write this song. So she writes the song, obviously a magical record. And I was lucky enough to to find it uh, before anybody else did and and, and release it. And, 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 you know, we marketed it with Republic Records, my partners who were great partners. And, and the record went to number one, as you said. Why do I bring that up? Because the Royals were the perennial losers in baseball, right? They were <laughs> last place every year. And that year they went right to the World Series. The song put them in the freaking World <laughs> Series. And then the next year they won. I think they should send me a check. What do you think? I think they should. Yeah, and she ended At up- At least a jersey. Something. I mean, yeah. I haven't even gotten a damn ticket to a game, but they, um, yeah, it was, um, it, it's really interesting how that works, the energy of it. And uh, she ended up meeting George Brett, I think, at some 
somewhere along well, the line. You a became great chairman and CEO of Atlantic Records and then chairman and CEO of Virgin Records. And then that led to a merger with Capital. And then you create Capital Music Group. And then you say, yeah, I got lucky and found that record before somebody else did. It's funny, the harder you work, the luckier you get. You ever notice that? Well, that's that's true. But that same passion is what you're doing with these guys you're trying to get out of jail. Yeah, I mean, the one is, uh, you know, what did Winston Churchill say, right? We make our living by, uh, by we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. I don't know. Like, to me... Um, the idea that I'm in a place in life and, you know, I was born very lucky. You can't be much luckier than to be born to the parents that I had in the city that I was born in and that I have an opportunity to um, to do something that I'm passionate about that actually impacts people's lives in a meaningful way. You know, like, I love doing it. I wish I didn't have to do it. Like, I wish we could rave a magic wand. You may have one of those here in the office somewhere. No, I don't. But I do know... Dr. Flom. Oh, yeah, Dr. Flom. That's yeah, right. I do know him. I'm not going to tie you to some study here, but you estimate as many as 8% of people in prison are wrongfully convicted. I think that's low, but you think 8%. Yeah, well, listen. I think your opinion on this matters a lot. Um, the fact is that I'm I'm going by you know there have been studies that have been conducted where people have said anything from four to seven percent. I ask people who are inside prisons that have served decades, you know, uh, um, people who are wrongfully convicted. I think they're pretty good at identifying others who are in their same situation, and uh, you know they'll they've given me estimates anywhere from eight percent to twenty percent. But I think too we have to look at it inside the numbers. Look, we know that in Florida, right? And let's talk about the death penalty for a second, because I hate the damn death penalty. And in Florida, there's a guy named James Daly right now who's facing execution. And my friend Josh Dubin represents him. He's an extremely gifted lawyer who recently uh, won a, a, a reversal on a death penalty case of a guy named Clemente Aguirre in Florida who served 14 years for a crime he absolutely certainly didn't commit. And James Daly's either going to be the 100th, 100th person executed by Florida or the 30th one exonerated from death row. Now, let me just do that again. He's either going to be the 100th person executed by the state of Florida or the 30th one exonerated from death row. So even if Florida got the other 99 right, and we know that they didn't because Jesse Tafaro was innocent and there have been others, but even if they did, they're not even getting it right seven times out of 10. So how the hell can anyone support the death penalty in that scenario? And here you have the James Daly case where this guy, you know, there's no evidence against him whatsoever. The killer has said he did it by himself and that this guy had nothing to do with it. There never was any forensic evidence or, or biological evidence connecting him to the crime. Awful crime, by the way. And the only thing that they've got is the testimony of a jailhouse snitch who testified in 37 different cases. Now, you got to be really something to have 37 different people just decide to bear their soul to a stranger when they never told anybody else that they did anything. It's ridiculous. And, and the time, New York Times did a great story about this horrible jailhouse snitch uh, recently. But, but Daly's still facing execution, just like Rodney Reed is and just like Rob Will is and just like... Too many people, uh, 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 there's a guy named Batiste in Texas who's innocent on death row. And we know there's been some pe innocent people executed down there in, in, in recent times. Larry Swearingen. Um, I mean, and by the way, let me ask you this, because you're the one who's got the degrees in, in psychology, right? More degrees than a thermometer. Which is exactly how many I don't have. So how is it that we have case after case, not all of them, but more than several, like Liddell Lee, where the state has refused to test the evidence prior to execution. How can that be that the state doesn't want to know when there's evidence that could prove it could, and we're still trying to get Liddell Lee's evidence tested. We're still trying to get Sedley Alley's evidence tested in, in, um, in Tennessee. He's dead. Both of them have been executed. And the state refused to test the evidence. Can you, can you kind of unpack that one for me? I can. And let me take the devil's advocate's position on this. Because I've talked to prosecutors about this before. And think about it in terms of how many people are in prison, not just restricting it to death row, who are constantly saying, 
I want this tested. I want that tested. I want this tested. I want that tested. And are never satisfied. No matter what you do, they're never satisfied. They say, well, you didn't test this. Well, you didn't test that. Well, you didn't test this. Well, you didn't test that. And so when you get to a death row case, they say, well, you've got an execution date. And they say, well, but we want you to test the stuffing in the pillow that was next to the woman who was choked to death. You didn't test that because they could have rolled off of her and had transfer DNA on that. We want that tested. And this can go on just ad nauseum, ad nauseum. And they finally get to the point where they say, look, we've tested everything that is reasonable and we're not going to do this anymore. You had a trial. You had the opportunity to bring forth the evidence that you had. And that's due process. You had it. You lost. You appealed. You lost. You appealed. You lost. You appealed. You lost. It's over. And that's their attitude. I don't think, and I honestly believe this, I don't think prosecutors take lightly a death penalty case. I think they believe what they believe. In some of these, I just clearly don't agree with them. 100% just clearly do not agree with them. But I think that's why they say we would never, ever test enough stuff. And we also have to realize There are some bad dudes on death row. One of the executions in Texas recently, whether you're for the death penalty or not, they had one of the two guys that tied the African-American gentleman to the back of their pickup and drug him down the road until he was dead. I mean, it's clearly a hate crime, clearly racist. It's a horrible crime. They executed him. He was the instigator, the leader, and he really made no bones about it. So some of these cases are just really cut and dry where the person says, yeah, hell yeah, I did it. And the evidence is clear. They've got it on video or whatever. But then there are those cases where if you go back and, as you say, unpack what happened, that's just not the case. They didn't have that due process at trial. You know, because I think sometimes things get said so much that they lose their meaning. Like you say, you have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. That's so much into the nomenclature of our society that we really don't stop and think about what that means. Because beyond a reasonable doubt means that the prosecution's evidence is such that no logical explanation can be derived from the facts as presented other than the defendant committed the crime. That 12 people can go in this room and there is no reasonable explanation, there is nothing that they could reasonably differ about that the defendant committed the crime. That is a very high standard. And it should be a very high standard because if you're depriving And people may not understand, in civil proceedings, there are different standards of proof, right? In civil proceedings, you have to have clear and convincing evidence or preponderance of evidence. Preponderance means it's more likely than not. It can be 51-49. likely did it, 49% didn't. It can be that close. Because you're just talking about money damages. You're not talking about putting somebody in jail. And so on some contract cases, it can be just preponderance of the evidence. If you can just get it just probably breached, that's enough. Or clear and convincing evidence where it's highly likely that he did it. And the evidence establishes a high probability that the facts are true. But when you get into the criminal court... And now you're talking about depriving someone of their liberty or their life. You've got to present it so strongly that 12 people go in a room and they look at each other and they say, there is nothing we can disagree about. We can talk about it for a little while, but when we get through, 12 of us are going to have to say, nah, there's no alternative here. There's no other explanation. And when you think about that and say, he's either going to be the 30th one they got wrong or the 100th one they execute, somebody has lost the meaning of beyond a reasonable doubt. 30 times? 
12 people went in a room and agreed beyond any doubt, any reasonable doubt, that there was an alternative explanation possible. Hmm. They got that wrong 30 times, 12 people. The collective IQ was 1,200, and they got that wrong 30 times. Hmm. And you know what every one of those 30 cases has in common? Every one of those was a brutal, horrible crime, and in every one of them, I think in every one of them, it's fair to say that when the when the innocent guy got convicted, the guilty guy remained free and was free to uh, uh, victimize more people who never should have been hurt in the first place. So it has a ripple effect that affects all of us, and that's why I think everyone should care. I mean, you know, the other thing that, you know, going back to what you were saying about the civil case, and I want to talk about false confessions in a second, but on the civil thing, and I'm glad you brought that up, What's crazy is that in our system, in a civil case, you have to turn over everything, right? right. Well in advance of the hearing, trial, whatever you're going to have. Depositions, right? document production, everything. Everything. You can't withhold anything. But in criminal cases, and only just now in New York, they changed this uh, last year, but they were you were able to have the evidence turned over to the defense. First of all, when the Supreme Court ruled in Brady that exculpatory evidence must be turned over to the defense in 1964, they left a little window because they said that it's up to the prosecutors to decide what they consider exculpatory. So um, it leads to it has led, unfortunately, to many, many violations. But some known, some unknown. But in New York, up until recently, they were able to turn that evidence over on the day of the trial. So literally, you'd have cases, and we've talked about this again on my podcast, Wrongful Conviction, where they come in the, the day of the trial, literally, and drop a bunch of boxes down and go, here you go. Now, what is this public defender or whoever you have, any, any defender, I don't care if it's Clarence Darrow, what are they supposed to do with these boxes on the day of the trial? They're supposed to review all that stuff and make an educated, informed decision about anything? Well, that's a trial tactic, of course. I mean, you take documents that could be exculpatory, you hide them in a sea of minutia, and say, we produced it. We give you a thousand pages of documents, and there is one paragraph on document 672, page 14, that clears your client. Right. Good luck. Needle in a haystack. Yeah, that was the case in the Duke Lacrosse case, and luckily that one guy was a hero and found it. I'm saying 30 times they went in and got it wrong, that there could be an alternative explanation. When... I was working in the litigation arena. The first thing I asked for when I was retained in a case, the first thing I asked for was the jury charge, the instructions and the jury charge. And I swear, every time people looked at me and said, we're not going to deal with that for two years. We don't have a trial setting yet. I don't care. I want to see what the jury is going to be asked at the end of this journey. When we're all done, what's the definition the judge is going to give them for rape or murder or attempted murder or kidnapping? What's the definition? How is he going to define it or how is she going to define this to the jury? And then what are the questions that are going to be asked of the jury? And once I know that, My entire case is going to be built around that symbol system. I'm going to use those terms, those words, and start educating and reinforcing that jury on that from the minute we begin. And all the evidence that's going to be marshaled is going to be aimed towards proving those elements were not met, that you can't prove those up. And if you're not doing that, you're like an unguided missile. And one of the biggest mistakes that I see made, and this is with public defenders that have so many cases, innocent means you did not commit a crime. Not guilty means the prosecution did not prove you committed the crime. And that is a very different standard. And they just simply don't emphasize that enough because people will say, I just don't know that he's innocent. We're not asking you if he's innocent. We're asking you if the prosecution proved he committed the crime. And if they don't prove he committed the crime, then you are deemed, you are instructed by the court to acquit. 
No, I'm glad you brought that up. And for people who, everyone who's listening is someday going to get a jury duty notice. Um, we all get them. And it's a nuisance. It's an imposition. Everybody's busy. I respect that. But I implore you to go and serve and to, you know, listen to what Doc is saying because, you know, you know ben, Benjamin Franklin is credited with the quote, it's attributed to him where he said it's better that a hundred guilty men go free than that one innocent should suffer. Now we can disagree on the percentages of what um, you know the great man said, but the fact is that um, it, it it is an unspeakable injustice for for a jury to convict. Uh, not that it's necessarily their fault, because a lot of places they are misled um, or they're not presented with the right facts. But if you're not sure, you cannot vote to convict because of exactly what Doc just said. And and I, I want to do, I would like to touch on false confessions um, because, you know, we're actually about to launch a new podcast um, called False Confessions under the Wrongful Conviction banner on February 19th. Um, I went to jury duty, by the way. Oh, you did? Yeah, I got my summons and I went. What kind of case was it? It was a property case. Somebody was trying to repossess their property and couldn't get it back, but I didn't get very far. You know what would have been really funny? is if the judge was Judge Judy. That would have been incredible. <laughs> you know, they had me read the answer to these questions up on the wall and like, what do you do and what was your prior job and all that stuff. So they didn't accept you onto the jury? No, they didn't. Oh, shocking. They don't usually accept me either. No, the two sides enough. leaned over and talked to each other and they agreed. Now, we, neither one of us want to <laughs> take this risk. without that guy. Yeah, yeah, they, they let they, me off. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. Although, although everybody would have been better off if you were on it, as it turns out. Um, or at least somebody would have been. Let's talk about this other podcast here. The name of the podcast is what that's coming out? So the podcast is called False Confessions, and you can subscribe to it right now. Um, and the fact is that it comes out February 19th. And on this podcast, uh, it's a podcast hosted by Laura Nyrider and Steve Drizzen, who many people will remember from, uh, from their roles on Making a Murderer. In the second season, they were... Um, really that they were they were uh, uh, front and center the whole second season of making a murderer and they represented brendan dassey and of course they won a reversal and then the state appealed the reversal they asked for an en banc hearing and the uh, i think it's the fourth circuit court uh, granted it strangely enough and it was rever the reversal was reversed four to three and poor Brendan, who everybody knows is innocent, uh, it remains in prison to this day. He's been in prison now. I mean, he was convicted, uh, arrested when he was, what, 16 or something? I think he's been in prison almost as long as he was alive before he was in prison. And mm -hmm. and there's um there's very, you know, his prospects are, are grim. I mean, he, without some legal miracle, and he does have a fantastic team led by the Center for Wrongful Convictions um, at Northwestern, um, but there, you know, the Supreme Court refused to hear his case, and uh, we're really hoping that the governor will see clear uh, to to granting him clemency. The governor is a guy who comes from a background in special education. Obviously, Brendan was a special education uh, student and was, um, you know, was in no way involved in this crime. Didn't have any knowledge of it. Um, there was never any evidence that he did. And uh, he was sort of collateral damage, in my view, and it's a tragedy. I, I visited him in prison in Wisconsin, and he's just a, he's just a, a kid tra trapped in a very, very adult nightmare, and it, it breaks my heart. And, uh, you know, I, I really do hope that this governor will do the right thing and send him home. Well, I can't say everything that you just said. You said he had nothing to do with it, wasn't there, didn't this, didn't that. You know more about the case than I do if you're able to say that. I can't say that. What I can say is he has never had a fair trial. There's a false confession. He was fed the confession. He was led in the statements that he made. They were written for him. He went in without legal representation. In fact, I believe his lawyer walked him in there and said, here, talk to them. I'm going home. Bye. He's a minor without a parent. It's a false confession, and he's never had a fair trial. And, 
And the false confession in his case is now being used because there's video of it, of course. And the video, well, I say of course, but there are some, some places where they still don't videotape interrogations. I believe they should videotape not only every interrogation, but I think they should videotape witness interrogations as well. But the fact is that Brandon's interrogation was so deeply flawed that it's now used in certain teachings at police departments as an example of what not to do, right? (laughs) And I think it's very important that we highlight for your audience that in wrongful conviction cases, cases where we've proved with scientific certainty that the individual who was convicted was in fact innocent, approximately 25% of those cases involved false confessions. And this is a a crazy thing for people to process because I'm sure everyone listening is saying, well, I would never confess to a crime I didn't commit. That's crazy. I'm not stupid. I would never do that. But we know that everybody has a breaking point. And on this podcast, False Confessions, you'll hear each week another case of false confession with actual audio footage from the from the interrogations themselves that will blow your mind and these lawyers laura and steve are so brilliant um in the way that they present it and i'm really honored to be a part of of you know helping to distribute and promote their podcast through the under the wrongful conviction banner but it's called false confessions and these stories are insane. People you wouldn't think would ever confess. Military people, right? People who are high IQ people, people who are low IQ people, people who have challenges, people who don't. But they get into that interrogation room. And it's so important for everyone to know. And and you said this on the show last time I was on, Doc. If you get picked up and brought in for questioning, even if they don't say you're a suspect, even whatever, but it's a crime you don't know anything about, the only thing you should say is, my name's Dr. Phil. No, you can't say that. My name is whatever, whatever your name is, and I want a lawyer. And then stop talking because, you know, you may want to be helpful, and, and, and we all want to be helpful to law enforcement. We all want to, you know, be a part of the solution. Um, I grew up respecting people in uniform. I still do. But the fact is that if you find yourself in that situation, unless you're the type of person that likes to perform surgery on yourself without anesthetic, I don't recommend that you do that because you you will be heading into a nightmare that is that will soon be out of your control and you may well end up. And by the way, and that extends to if you're on a jury, because remember in false in, in 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 those interrogations, they're allowed to lie to you. I know people. I'm going to say that again. They're allowed to lie to you. They tell you you failed the polygraph even when you didn't. They can say they found evidence that shows you did it. They can say they they uh, they got um, uh, video tape, video footage of you committing the crime. And there have been people who have gone through this interrogation process, as you know, Doc, and have come out actually believing that they committed the crime that they didn't commit. That's how you know masterful these interrogators can be in this, uh, even without physical violence, or even sometimes without the threat of physical violence, in terms of their psychological protocol, it can lead to people being so you know, brainwashed that they come out believing that they committed the crime that they didn't commit. So if the only evidence, my point is, if, you go on, if you're on a jury and the only evidence in the case is a, false, is a confession, you cannot convict based on the confession alone. There's got to be. Would you would you disagree with me? Because we don't we come at this from different sides. But, but doesn't there have to be some corroborating evidence, Doc? There has to be, particularly if somebody recants the confession. I mean, if they stick with their confession, and this is the problem. I think you have to treat all statements the same, and not be biased in the way you attack them. Here's what happens. You can give a confession that can have inconsistencies all through it, and those will be completely ignored, and they will convict you with that false confession. If you gave an alibi with inconsistencies riddled all through it, they'd tear it apart. But if you fail to mention in the murder that the throat was cut and she was stabbed 38 times, you don't bring that up. That's a real omission. Oh, I forgot to mention I stabbed her 38 times. If you had that big of a glaring omission in your alibi, they would tear it apart. And that has to be pointed out to a jury when you go in to attack that. And if you don't have something corroborating it, it doesn't fit the timeline. It doesn't fit the methodology. There's not some DNA. There's not blood splatter. There's not something that 
corroborates it, you just simply can't do it. And eyewitness testimony, oh my God. Eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. You know, people say, well, there were two eyewitnesses. Well, then you maybe got a 25% chance they're remotely correct. People just don't understand eyewitness testimony is not good testimony. And if you understand Gestalt psychology and the person interviewing the eyewitness can create closure on what they remember and guide it directly to what they want it to be, these things are not explained to a jury unless you bring in an expert on the subject, and the defense often doesn't have the money to do that. It's so important for people to understand this. And even on my podcast, Wrongful Conviction, I've interviewed people who falsely confessed like Marty Tankliff, like Johnny Hincapier, like um, Michelle Murphy. She didn't even really confess. They claimed she did. Um, like uh, there's so many. Oh, how about the Central Park Five? A lot of people have seen When They See Us, a wonderful movie. Um, terrifying, but wonderful. Um, wonderfully done by Ava DuVernay. But, but uh, you know, I interviewed Raymond Santana and um, Dr. Yusuf Salam, um, who, who were, you know, kids, young kids. I mean, young teenagers when they were interrogated for, you know, and you don't see this, of course, when you see the confession, but many of these people have been interrogated for a day or more, two, three, four. I just read the case of a guy named Airman Anderson. He was a, uh, I don't remember his first name, but he was in, in the Air Force who confessed after four days of questioning. Um, and uh, ultimately, he finally confessed when they told him that his wife said he did it. And, and you know, it was a brutal crime of a friend of his who was wife and, and, and child were killed. And, um, you know, he then they said to him, listen, if you don't confess, you know, we're going to we're going to arrest your wife as well. And your kids are going to be in foster care. And they're going to you know, they just went and he finally just broke down after, like I said, four days of questioning. So and then what they may do in these cases, as you know, Doc, is they may bring you into a different room, well lit, spacious room, try to get you relaxed, give you something to eat. And then and then have you they'll video and then they'll, they'll they'll redo the confession in a place where it looks better for the jury. And but you're absolutely right. There's so many of these cases, including Brendan's. Brendan didn't know how she died and he kept guessing because he wanted to give them what they wanted. And they finally told him. It's pathetic. Yeah. yeah. They, they finally told him what happened. And even then he couldn't get it right. So it's it's really awful. And, um, you know, there, there are so many of these that uh, that we've seen now that it's not a coincidence and it, it needs to stop. And we need to we need to have better practices. We need to be, basically, we need to be better to each other. I mean, these are all human beings who had lives and families and dreams and hopes. And, um, you know, and now they're in this, you know, this impossible situation um, because they got tricked by people. And, of course, most people go into that room, that interrogation room, believing that if they just say their truth, they'll be allowed to go home. Jeffrey Deskovic, what a horrible case, right? Where he was cowering in a fetal position under the table, 16-year-old kid, after nine hours of questioning. And and you hear these things, like he said, well, they told him, you can go home tonight, sleep in your own bed, you just got to confess. And they did the good cop, bad cop thing, they had a big tough cop who came in and threatened him with violence. The other guy says, Jeff, we're try to help you out here. And uh, in his case, Doc, awful, awful case in New York State where a, a young girl, the first day she was allowed out of her house by her parents, 15-year-old girl, uh, daughter of, of, of immigrants, I believe, and the first day they let her out by herself, she was raped and murdered. And Jeff, at his trial, his attorney presented physical evidence, biological evidence that proved that he could not have committed that crime, but the jury believed the false confession over the evidence, over the science. And he was convicted and ended up serving 16 long, miserable years. But now he's uh, now he's a lawyer. He's, he's, uh, he's done an, an incredible, incredible uh, transition. And he's now, uh, he's one of my heroes. All these people are my heroes. I got to tell you, I mean, it, it, I, I, do, I can't say enough about the Robert Joneses and the, you know, Keon Katabi's now a lawyer. Then uh, my friend Dieter Tejada is establishing a bar association for formerly incarcerated people, which I think is going to be incredible. But to play a part in helping these extraordinary, uh, brave is not a strong enough word, and uh, resilient people to you know make their way after they're released is something that i take very seriously and um it 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 also gives me it's obviously very sad in a lot of ways but it gives me a lot of joy to see them coming out and excelling when they do well 
the problem we've got to solve, as you said, is the bigger issue to keep them out of there. You know, you and I are working on a case right now that we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, on the air, and it's the Rob Will case. And I can tell you this is a case where a young man is on death row convicted of killing a sheriff deputy, a rookie, Barrett Hill. He was shot seven times. And I think sometimes you've got to look at it from a standpoint, if the wrong man is convicted and executed, and then some months later, or a year later, or whatever, they find out who really did it, how does that family feel? What do they say to themselves? Because they want justice. And if they execute the wrong man, now they look themselves in the mirror and say, oh my God, we pushed so hard for this, and now they've executed this person, and that is not who killed our father, our husband, our son. And the person who did is out there walking around. And there's 12 more victims, too, which are the jury members, yeah. you know, who have to live with that the rest of their lives. There was a wonderful podcast I recently listened to recently where a guy was talking about a Texas case where he was on a jury and he uh, was a holdout. He was the one guy who didn't believe the guy was guilty, but he didn't think that his vote mattered. He, they didn't instruct him that it had to be a unanimous verdict. So he finally was... Uh, browbeaten by the rest of the members of the jury because they all wanted to go home to say that he, um, you know, that that he would vote guilty, and he did. And of course, years and years later, the the person was found to be innocent, and they they ended up actually reconnecting uh, years later, and the the person who was wrongfully convicted forgave him and stuff. But he lives with uh, horrible guilt. And, and it's important, again, for everyone to know, your vote does matter. There are only two states where, actually only one state now, where the non-unanimous jury verdicts can stand because Louisiana overturned it last year. Oregon is the only state left where non-unanimous jury verdicts are allowed to stand. So, But your vote does matter. If you don't believe somebody's guilty, it doesn't matter what anybody else says to you. It doesn't matter if they want to go home, if they're busy or whatever. You have to you know, stand your your ground. That's why I said I always start with the jury charge. And jury charge is what the judge sends the jury into the jury room with. They give them a packet, and it has instructions that start out saying you need to elect a four-person. So decide who's going to actually be the head administrator, take the poll about who's voting one way or another. And then there are pages of instructions where it says, okay, here's the deal. I'm the judge of the law. You're the judge of the facts. You're to consider this. You're to consider that. Da, 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 da. And then it gets to the crime, and it defines the crime. You are never asked, do you think this person's guilty or innocent? What it does is it gives you a list of the elements that define attempted murder or attempted rape or grand larceny or whatever. And if you find that each of those elements have been proven, then you check them off and it says, if the answer to these is yes, then go to page four. If the answer is no, then go to page eight. It's not as simple as just, did he do it or did he not? Did she do it or did she not? And that's why I always start with that from the very beginning, because if you don't Somebody going into a jury room and not knowing it has to be 12-0 is malpractice. Somebody not educating the jury that your vote matters and don't split the baby and give us a lesser included offense of manslaughter or something. They got to understand that when they go in. And this Rob Will case where he's on death row supposedly for shooting a deputy and killing him when there's no forensic evidence whatsoever that indicates that he did so, no gunshot residue, no DNA, 
no witnesses, no nothing that says he did, other than that he was present and got shot himself. And my position in that case is I advocate for Deputy Hill. I advocate for justice. If they execute the wrong guy, that means that the person who did it gets away with it. And Deputy Hill's family may be frustrated that I am saying Rob Will should be taken off death row and sent home. But I think in the final analysis, they wouldn't be frustrated with me because I think when they look at all the evidence that we're bringing forth at this point, they're going to go, yeah, right. You saved us from advocating to execute the wrong guy. You know, I'm advocating for justice and I'm advocating for Deputy Hill and his family to get the right guy and do whatever they're going to do. I've talked to people that advocate for the death penalty and people that are dead set against it, but I've never met anybody that advocates for getting it wrong or being reckless. And the one thing I would say, Doc, is in, in when I get into, you know, um, debates about the death penalty with people who are pro-death penalty, and there are a lot of them, and some of them are people we would consider to be very reasonable people. I'm sure some of them are listening to us right now. My argument is if you are in favor of the death penalty, but you're aware that the justice system is not and never will be perfect. Even if everybody is doing their level best and we know that there are bad actors and there are mistakes that are made due to some of the things that we've talked about today and many, many other things. And if you know that even if the system is is you know redesigned and is made to function much, much better than it does now, there's still going to be human error. There's always going to be human error. We know the confessions can be false. We know the forensics can be mistaken. Uh, there can be bad forensic uh, work or other things. There can be uh, uh, junk science involved. There can be uh, misconduct at various levels. So my question is, if you're pro-death penalty, what percentage of innocent people are you okay with executing? Because if you're not okay with executing 1%, when we know it's much higher than that, you know, as the great Brian Stevenson says, if 10% of planes that took off crashed, nobody would fly. But we know that it's around 10% of people that are executed are innocent. So, and how would you feel if it was somebody you love? You know, I've been trying to help a guy whose father is going to be executed tomorrow in Georgia. And there are very uh, real concerns with this case. It seems extremely likely that he's innocent. I don't know all the details of it, but... This should not be allowed to happen in this country because it's it's final. I mean, you know, it sounds ridiculous to say it, but there's no taking it back. And we don't need it. There's no other Western country that has the death penalty anymore. There's, you know, we are in America, we're on a very, uh, uh, you know, we're on a list that we shouldn't really be on with countries that have the death penalty. We execute, I think we're in the, in the you know, among the countries, the, 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 we're in the top five, and that's a horrible thing to say because it should be the bottom five of countries that execute the most amount of people with, I think, Iran, China, um, there, there's a couple other ones. I mean, it's really not a list that we would hope that this country that we love would be on. Well, if you're going to have it, the standard needs to be much higher. It needs to be held in a much more transparent light, and there needs to be greater diligence in how you got to that verdict with that result. Because as you say now, you look at Brandon Dossi and you look at these different ways they get convictions, etc. If you're going to have the death penalty, then it needs to be a transparent due diligence till the cows come home. And that's just not the case. And if anybody still thinks we're, you know, talking out of our butts over here, go watch Just Mercy, the movie, um, the, the case of Walter McMillan, or watch Dr. Phil's episode on Rodney Reed or listen to Wrongful Conviction, the podcast on Rodney Reed, or you can see it uh, if you Google wrongful conviction now this, they did a video companion piece to that. Watch and learn everything you can about Rodney Reed's case. He was going to be executed until Dr. Phil and a number of other uh, powerful voices came up almost out of nowhere and and said, that's enough. Like, we're not going to stand for this. I know things that we can't talk about on this show that, that Phil was doing behind the scenes. 
um, and that I know that so many of you in his audience um, uh, uh, took action, wrote letters, made phone calls. I think the switchboards were melting down in, in Texas with, with people calling yes. up that, that heard you, your passion for this case, Doc, and, and said, no, we're not standing for this. Um, and it's only that miracle. It, it, but it took, it took people of your stature and, and others that to get involved in this case in order to stop an execution that certainly would have happened otherwise. And, we, and we're still fighting to get him freed and not to get executed. And the state is still trying to execute him. And they're up to all sorts of dirty tricks. But there are hundreds of other innocent people on death row in America who don't have you know, that type of, uh, of, of a, a movement, a, 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 a voice. And, and we're going to, I can say, I'm going to speak for both of us now, you know, we're going to continue to shine a light on these cases. We're going to highlight as many of them as we possibly can. We're going to try to have uh, uh, have better justice, fairer uh, uh, justice, and we're going to do, uh, I think it's fair to say, um, both separately and together, everything we can to make sure that, that we try to stop these wrongful executions and wrongful convictions from happening with the same regularity in the future. So I felt, look, I appreciate, you know how much I appreciate you allowing me to, uh, to share uh, uh, the stage or in this case, the microphone with you and, um, you know, and, 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 and share some of the experience that I've had in this quarter century of work in this field. I encourage everyone to get involved, listen to Wrongful Conviction, the podcast, but moreover, go to innocenceproject.org, uh, learn more, go to the local Innocence Project in your in your area and, and learn more about this and get involved. Right, we're going to have links to these different entities on our website for fill in the blanks. It's also going to be on drphil.com. It's going to be on Facebook. So you can find them. So if you're driving or jogging or walking or something, can't write these things down now, just know that they'll be there so you don't have to remember them. But let me finish with a crisp reminder. It's Wrongful Conviction with Jason Flom, right? Wrongful Conviction with Jason Flom, that's it. And the new one that comes out February 19th is? False Confessions. False and Confessions. It's uh, it's hosted by Laura Nyrider and Steve Drizzen, and you won't want to miss this one. It will really rock your world. Okay. False Confessions, February 19th. But you can subscribe now wherever you get your podcast, yeah. you so don't You can subscribe wait. now, but it'll drop on February 19th. Jason, thank you very much. Doc, pleasure. Thank you for uh, having me on. Always love it. We'll do this again.